Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will look at the remaining annealing processes and learn the basics of hardening and tempering. All steel contains more or less cementite. Most of the cementite is present in the perlite portion as lamella embedded in soft ferrite. Hyperperlitic steel also has secondary cementite on the grain boundaries. Both forms of cementite are the carriers of hardness and strength. But at the same time they are unfavorable for both machining and cold forming. In soft annealing the aim is to achieve properties that facilitate mechanical processing, low forces and longer tool life. In other words a higher number of workpieces that can be produced with one tool, with a high surface quality. As the name suggests, soft annealing reduces the hardness of a material to a specific value. During annealing just below the PSK line, the lamella in the perlite are transformed into small grains due to the surface tension. The annealing time is up to 100 hours. Initially, a network of cracks develops. Later, the fragments strive for an angular to roundish grain shape. Both metallographic images show the tempered steel C45. In the left image, it is shown in the normalized state, resulting in a ferritic polytic microstructure. The cementite is present in lamella form in the perlite embedded in ferrite. The right picture shows the same steel after a 24 hour soft annealing at 720 degrees Celsius. The cementite lamella have formed into grains which are finely dispersed in the ferrite. As roughly sketched here, the decreasing hardness is accompanied by a decrease in strength. Obviously, however, the toughness also increases. Soft annealing is therefore mainly used for steel with a carbon content of greater than 0.5%. Low carbon steel becomes so soft as a result of the annealing treatment that they tend to smear, especially during drilling. Stress relief annealing is performed with the purpose of relieving internal stresses in the workpiece. Stress relief annealing is usually carried out on steel in the temperature range of 550 to 650 degrees Celsius, whereby the material begins to flow plastically in accordance with the stresses. Workpieces treated with this process have internal stresses mostly caused by uneven cooling after casting, welding, forging or other thermal processes. Intense mechanical processing such as milling, turning, planning, deep drawing, cold forming often requires stress relief annealing. Without this manufacturing step such major stresses would be released during further processing and subsequent heat treatments and lead to geometric deviations due to distortion. However, the stresses are not completely relieved, hence the term stress relief annealing. Annealing reduces the yield strength and maximum tensile strength for the duration of heating, which forces the material to flow plastically in accordance with the stresses up to the yield point. Internal workpiece stresses are reduced by stress relief annealing before finishing. This reduces unwanted distortion during final mechanical finishing. Again and again, bad surprises occur when we think we can carry out an annealing treatment after the final machining of the workpiece and do not take into account that the dimensions of the workpiece still change significantly due to structural changes and the reduction of internal stresses. It is important to note in connection with stress relief annealing that stainless steels with niobium and tantalum
contents must not be stress relief in yield. The exact background information can be found in the later videos on high alloyed steels. Recrystallization annealing is an annealing process to reverse the changes in the properties of the material. For example, higher strength with lower toughness, forced by cold forming. I had already talked about this briefly at the end of lattice types and defects when we learned about work hardening via the introduction of dislocations by cold working. In many cases, for example, deep drawing operations, recrystallization annealing is required in between to, pro to produce the high formability required for further drawing work. The annealing temperatures depend strongly on the degree of cold deformation and the initial microstructure. They can be between 500 degrees Celsius and the AC3 point, but are usually around 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. The result of the recrystallization annealing is a newly formed recrystallized microstructure whose grain size is highly dependent on the degree of deformation. The resulting grains are no longer elongated as shown in the picture on the left, but coaxial as shown in the picture on the right. The reason for the regained formability of recrystallizing annealed materials is a reduction of the dislocation density. Since in most cases fine-grained microstructure is desired in order to obtain an optimum combination of strength and toughness, critically deformed low-carbon steel with a degree of deformation between 5 and 15 percent must not be recrystallized in order to avoid coarse grain formation. In such cases, the workpiece should be normalized. Compared to normalizing, however, recrystallization annealing has a number of advantages. On the one hand, much lower annealing temperatures are required to produce a fine-grained microstructure, which has a positive effect on both energy costs and scaling, especially with thin sheets. On the other hand, the dimensional accuracy of recrystallization annealed parts is greater. However, the degree of deformation, annealing time and annealing temperature must be precisely matched during recrystallization. Otherwise, there is a risk of coarse grain formation. In the case of materials that are not capable of transformation, such as high alloyed austenitic steel samples, recrystallization annealing is the only way to change the grain size at all. Even though hardening and tempering are actually special annealing processes, they are treated separately as we saw in the last video. The aim of these processes is to give the material a combination of properties, hardness and toughness, which can be changed within limits and adapted to the respective requirement profile of the component. Both processes are based on the same internal processing during the accelerated cooling, quenching of the steel, but differ in the temperature selected for subsequent tempering. During hardening, tempering is carried out at a low temperature in order to achieve the highest possible hardness with adapted toughness. For quenching and tempering, a higher tempering temperature is selected with the aim of achieving high toughness with an additionally increased yield strength. From the videos about the time temperature transformation diagram, we already know the prerequisites for hardening steel. First, there must be a lattice transformation from face-centered cubic arsenide to body-centered cubic ferrite at the holding point AR3. Furthermore, the practical insolubility of the carbon in the ferrite must be given. And as we already learned, the transformation of arsenide to ferrite only occurs with very slow cooling. If the cooling rate is increased, the position of the holding point A3 and A1 
of a steel with a certain carbon content changes. As the cooling rate increases, the holding points merge and then disappear completely. However, a new holding point called the Martensite start temperature occurs before this happens. Here, the transformation of arsenide to Martensite begins. Then the lower critical cooling rate is exceeded. During hardening, a Martensite microstructure as pure as possible should be formed, thus completely suppressing perlite formation. For this purpose, cooling must be performed not only at the lower critical cooling rate, but also at the so-called upper critical cooling rate. This depends mainly on the carbon content and the content of other alloying elements. This figure shows how strong the influence of carbon content already is on the critical cooling rate. However, alloying elements such as manganese can also redu reduce the critical cooling rate to values below 100 degrees Celsius per second, even in quantities below 1%. In the video about the time temperature transformation diagram, we had already learned that with a high critical cooling rate, in the very short time available, diffusion of the carbon can no longer take place. So martensite is thus formed without any change of position of the carbon atoms. The carbon is forcibly dissolved and distorts the lattice tetrag tetragonally. The resulting internal stresses, together with the solid solution hardening by the carbon atoms, lead to the great hardness and at the same time brittleness of the martensitic structure. The hardness, which is strongly dependent on the carbon content, is between 400 and 850 Hv. The forming plate-shaped crystals appear in the micrograph as needles. For steel, containing more than 0.6 weight percent carbon and sufficient alloy alloying elements, the martensite finish temperature, MF, becomes lower than 20 degrees Celsius. When quenching, these materials form the arsenide state to room temperature. Part of the initial arsenide phase is thus retained in the microstructure. This arsenide is called retained arsenide. It represents a relatively soft, metastable structural component. Retained arsenide leads to a lower total hardness, especially when quenching from temperatures above the SE line. Hyperpolytic steel may therefore only be heated above the SK line during austenitization to avoid much retained austenite with low hardness. In some time temperature transformation diagrams, the expected retained austenite content is therefore often also indicated. When quenching larger cross-sections, the limited thermal conductivity of the steel leads to temperature differences between the core and the edge of the sample. It follows the, that during cooling, the core has a higher temperature than the edge and the core reaches the important temperature of the perlite region later than the edge. If the critical cooling rate is just reached in the surface layer, it is increasingly undercut towards the core. As a result, unalloyed steel only achieves a martensitic layer with high hardness on the surface. We then speak of surface hardening steel. In this context, I would like to define once again the important terms relating to hardening and tempering. Even though we have already mentioned some of them in the video about the time temperature transformation diagram. Hardenability is the property of steel to take in hardness when quenched. It is described by two material characteristics. Hardening capacity is described by the greatest hardness attainable at the edge. It depends solely on the carbon content. More than 65 HRC which corresponds to about 720 Hb, is not possible. Hardenability is described by the hardening depth, ET, 
of the martensitic transformation. Hardening depth is a distance in millimeter from the edge perpendicular to the core to a point with an agreed limit hardness. Through hardening is the hardening up to the core of the workpiece. We have already learned that one of the main reasons and possible applications for alloyed steel is that either thicker workpieces can be through hardened or, in the case of thinner wall workpieces, milder quenching media such as oil can be used because alloying elements reduce the critical cooling rate. Unalloyed steel can only be hardened in a strong quenching medium such as water and then only up to a low hardening depth. Therefore, such steel is called water or shell hardeners. Many types of low alloyed steel can also be hardened in a milder quenching medium such as oil so that they are often referred to as oil hardeners. Certain types of alloyed steel often also allow hardening when cooled in air or even through hardening. They are called air hardeners. Thank you for your attention. Don't miss the next video in which we will finish the topic heat treatment of steel.